please rise as we sing our first song on page 168. Sing Hosanna, page 168.
Lord is near to all those who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Amen. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, as we consider the subject of forgiveness, we thank you for all that you've taught us about how much you love us and how you forgive us and ask us to make the changes we need to make. Lord, thank you for teaching us to forgive one another, that we may truly receive your forgiveness. Lord, today we ask, us, ask you that you may teach us to forgive ourselves for the mistakes that we make, that we may move forward in trust and hope that you love us and are guiding us and have a plan for us. Show us your ways, Lord. Lead us and teach us. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Amen. All right, you all be seated, and children, you are welcome to come forward for your talk if you'd like to do that. Come on up. Morning. Hi, Atticus. Hello. Nice to see you guys. Good morning. So today, as you come up, I want to start with a, I guess we'll call it a, a yes or no question quiz. Some of you might be able to read that. Some of you might not be able to read it. But I want to ask you your opinion of these questions, okay? Do you want to read that question? Um, yeah. Should I other yes, very good. Should I forgive other people is the question. Yeah. What do you think? You guys think we should or we shouldn't forgive other people? Yeah. We should. Anyone disagree with that? You think we should forgive people? Okay. So why don't we mark that? Yes. All right. All right. You want to read the next one? Does the Lord, sorry, my writing's messy. It says forgive. So, forgive me. does the Lord forgive me? Yes. Does the Lord forgive me? Does the Lord forgive you? You, you? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Anyone disagree with that? Do you disagree or you agree? Yes. Disagree. All right. We have one dis disagreeer. That's all right. How about you? Um, I, I, I do agree. You do agree. So, I think for the most part, we, the Lord does forgive me. Okay. Now, the final question, which we'll talk about today, is, you want to read that one? Should I forgive myself? Very yes. good. Should I forgive myself? Yes. All right. So you all think you should forgive yourself, okay? Anyone disagree with that? You disagree with that, okay. Well, that's why we come to church, to learn all about this stuff, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start, well, we'll wait till the end of the talk to check that box. If I forget, remind me, okay, because we're going to ask the question again. Should I forgive myself? So we're going to read a story today about a woman who was caught doing something bad. Have you ever been caught doing something bad? Anyone here ever been caught doing something bad? Yeah, yeah. Or making a mistake, that kind of thing. So... At those days, the rules about this thing that she did was that they would stone her to death. You know what that means? Good, I'm glad you don't know what that means. Um, everyone would take stones and they'd throw them at the person until they died. Sounds pretty horrible, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, just, well, you, everyone would gather around and throw them at them. Probably big stones like this would hurt a lot. And eventually they would die or be buried in a pile of stones. So, pretty horrible thing. But in this story, someone is there that they bring her to to ask him what he thinks they should do because they caught her doing this. And that person is the Lord. So, let's see how he responds to their question. Are you ready? Sure. All right. Now, early in the morning, Jesus came into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, now the scribes and Pharisees were teachers of the word, teachers of the law, 
And, he came, and they brought to him a woman caught in adultery. I mean, she wasn't faithful to her husband. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. What do you think the Lord did? He just stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear them. So he just didn't pay attention to them. Okay? So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Do you know what a sin is? Someone who's sinned, because he uses that. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. So what he's asking them is, whoever who is here has never done anything wrong, you get to throw the first stone. Okay? So that's what he means by that. Let's see what happens. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience. So your conscience is that part of us when you know that you might be doing the wrong thing. You go, oh, I shouldn't do that, right? It's sort of a voice inside that says, that's wrong. I shouldn't do that. They went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Has no one said you're worthy of death? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It means to go and don't do those bad things anymore. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen. Wait. She committed adultery, which means if she was married to somebody else and she went and treated someone else as if he was her husband. So she sort of was unfaithful, didn't keep her promise to be married to him. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So she committed that and all those people were gathered together with stones ready to stone her to death. Like, we're going to, this is what we're supposed to do. And Jesus said, whoever has never done anything wrong, you throw the first stone. And so one by one, beginning with the oldest, they put back their stones and they walked away because they realized each one of us makes mistakes, right? All of us do. So no one was there. And then Jesus asked them, well, where are the people? And she said, I don't know. They said, well, I don't condemn you. I don't, I'm not going to throw stones at you either. I don't condemn you. I don't make you guilty of death. But he does say something important. Do you remember what he said to her? He said, go and sin no more. He said, don't go and don't do it again. So your parents, when you make a mistake, do they ask you not to do it again? Yeah. Yep. yeah. Right. So that's the goal, right, is if we make a mistake, is that we admit we made a mistake, maybe say we're sorry, maybe ask for help if we need help with that, and then try not to do it again. Yeah. So here's a couple things. You might see this in your Sunday school, which is if you make a mistake, you can say, I was wrong or I made a mistake. Right? And that can be hard to do. Any of you have a hard time admitting you make a mistake? That can be hard. But if we do that, the next thing we can say is, I am sorry. So if you hurt someone, what's a good thing to say? Sorry. I'm sorry. Right? And then we can do something else, which is ask the Lord for help. So you can pray, Lord, help me. Okay? Good, thank you. And then I will change. I will try to do different next time, okay? So if we make a mistake, do you think we should forgive ourselves? Yeah. What do you think? So should we check that, that box, do you think? Yeah. Because does the Lord say we're not forgiven? No, he forgives us, right? So he's asking us to try to do differently. So that's all he's asking is, don't do it again. So we should forgive ourselves and try to do better next time. Because sometimes we feel so bad, we feel like, I can never do the right thing. Yeah. And we just give up. What's the score? Three to zero. There you go. <laughs> An A plus? 
A plus. You guys, you want to grade for this? All right. I'll give you an A plus plus. How's that? Is that good? Yeah. All right. Good. Very good. Any questions about that? All right. Thank yeah. you for listening today. Why don't you go and we'll sing our next song. Thank you. Please stand as we sing our next song on page uh, 133. One thing have I desired. Page 133. Lord, freely we have received, freely we give. I invite you to bow your heads for a blessing on the children. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. Now I invite our teens and children to go to their programs while we sing our next song. On page 69, Healer of My Soul, page 69.
Next reading will be shared by Margaret Broughton. The first one is from Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Psalm uh, 86, 1 through 15. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. Arrogant foes are attacking me, O God. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. They have no regard for you. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Thank you. And the final reading for today is from the Heavenly Doctrines for the New Church from Secrets of Heaven, portion of 905. The presence of the Lord involves freedom, the one following the other. The more present the Lord, the more free we are. That is, the more we are in the love of good and truth, the more freely we act. Such is the influx of the Lord through the angels. But on the other hand, the influx of hell through evil spirits is forcible and impetuous, striving to dominate. For such spirits breathe nothing but the utter subjugation of us, so that we may be nothing, and that they may be everything. And when they are everything, we are one of them, and scarcely even that, for in their eyes we are a mere nobody." Therefore, when the Lord is liberating us from their dominion and from their yoke, there arises a combat. But when we have been liberated, that is, regenerated, we, through the ministry of angels, are led by the Lord so gently that there is nothing whatever of yoke or of dominion. For we are led by means of our delights and our happinesses and are loved and esteemed. This is what the Lord teaches in Matthew. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And is the reverse of our state when under the yoke of evil spirits, who, as just said, account us as nothing, and if they were able, would torment us every moment. Amen. Here end our lessons, and blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. People 
you understand me now? Sometimes I seem a little mad. Don't you know no one alive can always be an angel? Things go wrong and seem a little sad. I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. You know, sometimes I'm so carefree with a joy that's hard to hide. Sometimes seems that all I have is weird, and you're bound to see my other side. If I see magic, I want you to know that I'm never going to take it out. Life has its problems, and I get more than my share. But that's one thing I never mean to do. I don't mean it, people. Don't you know I'm old? Self alone, regretting some little things, some foolish thing I've done. But I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Oh Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. Don't let me be misunderstood. the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Have you heard the saying that people rise or will fall to the level of your expectation? Have you heard that before? Okay. So the idea is that if we expect more from other people, we will get more from them. Or if we expect less from them, we will get less from them. And there was an experiment I read about where they did this in a classroom. They gave us teachers a set of students' names, their list of names, and they put a little asterisk next to certain students to say that these are special students. So I want you to be aware of that, that they, they're pretty exceptional. And it was just sort of randomly picked, actually. <laughs> so they were unconsciously treated that way because the teachers had higher expectations for those particular students that they would excel. So they called on them more in class and they paid closer attention to what they were saying, what they were doing, because they were looking for that star, that specialness in those students. And the collusion was unmistakable. The kids did better because their teachers expected them to do better. Well, this article was shared in a business journal, and it was really about how do managers deal with their employees, or how do they help them to do better. And the lesson to the business managers was simple. If you want the best from your people, you have to expect the best from them. And it doesn't simply mean raising the bar on their expectations, but hoping for the best and believing in your people that they have an incredible capacity to do well. 
that they can really perform well if we believe in them and we trust in them. So how does that apply to us? What does that have to do with our spiritual life? I think we could say that our ability to move away from hurtful habits and practices will probably benefit from us raising the level of our expectations for ourselves. What I mean by that is if we get caught up in self, negative self-talk and low expectations for ourselves, we will likely fall or dip to those levels because we don't think we have much chance. So if I expect myself to do better, if I expect that I can do better, and I believe it's possible to do the right thing and give up bad habits and change for the better, can that have a difference? Well, think about that versus pouring hot coals over yourself and beating yourself up and defeating all of your efforts because you just don't think that you're worthy. I think that we can know that we can need to make changes in our spiritual life without it involving self-hatred. I think that's fair to say that. And religion has a history of causing people to loathe themselves, right? To feel badly about themselves. There's, it kind of has a reputation churches do. Some people say, I don't want to go to church because I don't want to feel bad about myself. <laughs> so there is that experience. People get treated harshly. They expect to be perfect, maybe, or they get treated like this woman gets treated in the story. Haul them out and throw stones at them. So we talked a few weeks back before we started this campaign about physical health and spirituality. And the sort of the point of that sermon was to talk about that our goal in having a healthy body or taking care of ourselves is that we might have a healthy mind in a healthy body so that we can be useful, so that we can serve a use. So there was, we want to take care of ourselves for a good purpose. So it's good to take care of ourselves, to treat ourselves with respect so to speak. And that's more than just our body. It's about how we hold ourselves. So we want to be the best version of ourselves so we can, because we have important work to do, right? Our work in this world is our spiritual growth. It's our regeneration, being born anew. So we have work to do. You think about this little quote, which I love from Jeremiah 29. The Lord says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I mean, that's the Lord talking to us about how he sees us. I, I want good things for you. I want you to have a future. I want you to have a hope. Have hope for yourself. So this is the fourth sermon in a series on forgiveness. We talked the first week about why forgive people or why focus on forgiveness. What benefit is there in forgiving other people or having that attitude? Then the second week we talked about forgiving other people. How do we forgive others who may have harmed us? And last week, about being forgiven ourselves. Are we forgiven by the Lord? How does that, what's the truth about that in our lives? And today's subject is self-forgiveness, forgiving ourselves. And my sense is, both, I guess, by self-observation and hearing from other people, is that this seems to be the most difficult one, to forgive ourselves. I don't know if you would agree with that or not, but it seems to be something that it digs away at us, makes us, frust- makes us feel less than, us, less than, I suppose. So why is that true, perhaps? Because it's how we view ourselves. We can set impossible goals for ourselves. We can say we have to be perfect. Or how poorly, we look at how poorly we treat ourselves, the kinds of things we say to ourselves, or the kind of things we think about ourselves. Here's a quote from Sherry Huber, who's an American author. She said, If you had a person in your life treating you the way you treat yourself, you would have gotten rid of them a long time ago. (laughs) Right? And the other thing is that we, I mean, other people might do things that we feel we need to forgive them for that we might be upset about, but you think about when you look at your own life, we have a whole lifetime of possible mistakes to draw upon to criticize ourselves and to feel bad about. And we have a committee from hell that's working to keep all those memories fresh in our minds and to remind us of the mistakes we've made and of our shortcomings. So the story that was shared for today to illustrate was a woman caught in adultery. She was caught in adultery in the very act, dragged out into the street where Jesus was, and there are crowds surrounding her with stones ready to stone her. 
Stones, in the word, can picture truths, like you think of David going up against Goliath with the five smooth stones. In this case, they picture falsified truths. They're things that are twisted around. Because that's often what happens in our own minds. We take something that's true and we just twist it, or the evil spirits are with us, twist it around, and accuse us and condemn us. So this whole crowd with stones is a picture of what's going on inside of our mind with the influence of the hells. Twist your intentions, rewrite your history, never let you forget the mistakes you've made or the things you deal with. And I don't know if you noticed that passage that we read here. It says, why do they do it? Their their intention is that we may be nothing and that they may be everything. That sounds pretty horrible to me. (laughs) They want you to be nothing. They want to make you feel so bad that you are nothing and they take all your power, all your life. Here's a couple passages that highlight this from the Heavenly Secrets. It says, For spirits from hell stir up and bring out all the wicked deeds you have performed and wicked thoughts you have entertained, and they use these to incriminate and condemn you. As a result, you suffer pangs of conscience, and anxiety fills your mind. You ever had that experience? I'm sure you have. (laughs) That's not you. That's them doing it to you. Again, from Secrets of Heaven, evil spirits call forth from your memory whatever you have thought and done from infancy. I don't remember anything about infancy, but it's pretty... (laughs) Imagine any bad feelings or things that they could draw up from your whole life. Horrible. An important point, though, is that those things they draw up aren't coming from us. Sure, they might have happened. It might have been things you thought about or even done. But the influence is from hell. It's not something we create. Heaven and Hell 302 says, If we believe the, thing, the way things really are, that everything good comes from the Lord and everything evil from hell, then we would not take credit for the good within us or blame for the evil. So all that stuff, we wouldn't accept that. Whenever we thought or did anything good, we would focus on the Lord, give the credit to him, and any, any evil that flowed in, we would throw back into the hell it came from. But, since we do not believe in any inflow from heaven or from hell, and therefore believe that everything we think and intend is in us and from us, we make the evil our own and defile the good with the feeling that we deserve it. So All that gets turned in on ourselves. But if we can understand that truth, it's not from me. It's from the hells who are with me, who want me to be nothing and them to be everything. It's flowing into me. I can let it pass through. Evil spirits want you to think it's from you, that you thought of it, that you want it. They want you to want it, but they're making you want to want it. (laughs) But don't believe that. And then they, when you do think about it, then they accuse you and condemn you. How dare you think about that? You're a horrible person. Okay, so the, what do we do with that? <laughs> well, why are angels considered to be happy? Do you think angels are happy? I mean, that's the idea, right? Well, I want to become an angel so I can be happy too. But angels are happy. And one of the things that the writings say about why they're happy is because they live in the present moment. They don't let things from the past come into the moment and ruin it for them. And they don't let anxiety about what could happen ruin it either. They live in the present moment. And how often do we let wounds or hurts from the past ruin the current moment we're in? Bring that back so I can relive it over and over again. That's something that causes unhappiness. Or we have anxiety about what will happen next. And that ruins our peace of mind as well. Angels are happy because they don't do that. They live in the present moment. So I've talked about this story before, and I've heard some of your responses before, which is, woman's caught in adultery. What about the man? (laughs) Where's he? Have you thought that before? I'm sure you have. Why is she the one that's brought out in the middle, and he's, you don't even talk about him. Is he just off? There's no problem. It's okay for him. Why not the man? Well, as we know, these stories are about us. These stories are mirrors that we can look at and see our own spiritual life within. So each person in the story is something that's going on inside of ourselves. So what each of these characters represent is something to think about inside of us. So in the word, 
men and women are often used differently because of the correspondence of what they symbolize. So men often picture our understanding or thoughts that we entertain. And women represent our loves or our affections. So we talked about we can't prevent thoughts from flowing into your head, right? They're just going to come in. You're not guilty for having a bad thought. You're guilty if you dwell on it and think, oh, that's a great idea. I would love to kick that person. I'm going to dwell on that, and I love that thought. But if you have that thought, oh, I'm going to kick that person, and you just let it go, no big deal. Thoughts come and go. That's not the part of us we have to deal with. We have to deal with what we care about, what our loves are, which is what the woman symbolizes in the story. So it's our affections, our feelings that we need to address. And the voices from the hells picture these stones that are wanting to be thrown at us all the time. Okay, let's accuse and condemn you. you. How can I make your life miserable? But the Lord does something very interesting in the story. He acts as if he doesn't even hear them. He just stoops on the ground and he's writing. He doesn't pay any attention to them. And that's a great strategy for us, right? If you hear, you have those thoughts, you have those ideas about hellish things to do, I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm not going to focus on that. That's from hell. We can't stop loving the evil that we love or wanting it. But we can stop doing it and we can stop thinking about it and then the Lord can change that love within us. It's very important to remember that. If you love something that you know is hellish and you're just trying to stop loving it, well, you can't by yourself. You can stop doing it. You can stop thinking about it when those thoughts come in and the Lord can change it. That's why the Lord says, I don't condemn you, but don't do it again. Don't sin no more. So guilt... How many of us suffer from guilt? <laughs> All right. Things in our life we can't let go of, we can't forget. Guilt is a useful tool, but it should be a short-term experience. When you do something you shouldn't do, you should feel guilty. That is right. You say, yep, I'm accountable for that. I did that. And then we need to let it go. Having it become a debilitating part of our lives is not what the Lord hopes for us. You didn't, in the story, you saw a very seemingly quick interaction with the Lord and the woman, like, okay, I don't condemn you. Just don't do it again. Okay, cool. Now go off. Don't do it again. I'm not, and he didn't say go and think about it over and over again for the rest of your life. No, he didn't say that. He said just don't do it, Okay. Guilt should inspire action on our part. When we feel badly, it should be a reminder to us or a, a flag that says, okay, I need to do something differently. And we should try to do something differently. If we have no sense of guilt, then we're in big trouble because we don't have conscience. And if we don't have conscience, we don't go to heaven. We have to have some reaction about things in our life that says, okay, I shouldn't be doing that. But think about the difference between guilt and shame. Shame becomes something very toxic in people's lives that can immobilize them. And again, the, the point of guilt is to get us to move forward. So here's how I like to differentiate the two that I think this Brene Brown does a lot with this subject, and I think she's inspired this, which is shame is when we focus on ourselves. Guilt is when we focus on a behavior. Like this is something I need to identify and work on. Shame is, I am bad, I am unworthy. Guilt is, I did something that is bad, I did the wrong thing. Guilt says, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Shame says, I am sorry, I am a mistake. You see the difference between the two of those. Guilt can help us to change, shame just makes us feel terrible and we don't respond to anything. So ways to work on this. First thought is to see yourself the way that the Lord and the angels do. The Lord loves us. The angels love us. They esteem us. We are loved and esteemed. There's nothing of yoke or dominion, as the passages say, in how they lead us. They overlook our faults. They put a good interpretation on them. 
Can we do that to ourselves? Second idea is remembering to differentiate between the voice of the Lord and the voice of the hells. Is this message a message from the Lord inspiring me to change for the better, or is this a message from hell helping me to just stay immobilized and feel horrible? Third idea we talked about is live in the present moment. Where am I now? The Lord doesn't care about where you were. He cares about where you are headed. Where am I trying to go? Do not allow the past to ruin the present moment. And don't worry about the future and let the moment be ruined. And as we talked about with forgiving other people, that self-forgiveness is a process as well. Something that we can work on throughout our lives. Something maybe we can get better at as we work on it. The other idea is ask if your guilt or shame is proving to be productive. Is this helpful or is it not? If it's not, I need to let this go. And when you do make a mistake, admit it, amend it, and move on. Do the steps of repentance that the Lord gives us. Examine yourself. Examine your behaviors, your intentions, your words, and recognize the faults. Hold yourself guilty. Again, short term, I did this. Yes, I did. But ask yourself, too, as you talk about this, is this really who I am? Is this what I really love? Because we are our core love. True Christian religion says, our purpose is what we love above all else. We focus on it each day in everything we do, that we do. It exists in our will like a hidden current in a river that moves and carries things along even when we are doing something else because it's what motivates us. So is this who I truly am at my core? And again, from Secrets of Heaven, it says, the Lord regards nothing in us but our goal. What are we trying to do? No matter what thoughts we have have thought or deeds we have done in all their countless permutations, as long as our purpose is good, these things are all good. When our purpose is bad, on the other hand, those things are bad. So the Lord looks at what is our goal, what's our end in view. And part of those steps of repentance is pray to the Lord to help us to not do it again. Think about that. When the woman was in the Lord's presence, it was worked out pretty well. All those negative things, all those people are trying to accuse and condemn her, went away. So you find yourself surrounded that way, call upon the Lord. Be in his presence the best you can. The final step is begin a new life. Take a step to do things differently. The old life is past. It's gone. It's over. You can't change any of it. You can change the next steps. You can't change the steps you've already taken. So I started by saying people will rise or fall to the level of our expectations. So we need to expect ourselves and believe it's possible that we can do the right thing, that we can give up the bad habits that we struggle with, that we can change for the better. And part of that is really believing what the Lord says about how he loves us and how he has forgiven us and that we don't stand condemned. Neither do I condemn you. But he asks us again, don't do it again. Try not to do it again. And if you do it again, do the steps of repentance again. But we can do it. The Lord is with us. That's what he's telling us. I can help you to make the changes that you need to make. And holding yourself in condemnation is not one of the steps of repentance. Hold yourself guilty for short term. Move on and make a change. Amen. Bow your heads with me for a moment. Lord, each of us probably has a list in our minds of things that we have tried to let go of, things that are troubling us. Lord, help us to know that you have forgiven us, that you love us, and you want us to move forward. Help us to learn to let go of those concerns, those anxieties, those regrets, and move ahead. Make new decisions in a new day that you've given us. This is the day that you have made. Help us to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. We can open the floor now. If you have any prayer requests for yourself or anybody else, then um, I'll have a minute of silent prayer following that. Anyone? Yep. Yeah. Take care.
apologize to her mom. Thank you. Denise. Thank you. Safe travels for Greg and Isaac. Anyone else? Good prayers for Greg, here and Serena Smith and Mary for Greg was in a car crash with them, so hoping that they will be okay. Thank you. Anything else? And let's have a minute of silent prayer. Lord, hear our prayers and may your love and healing powers go forth and be with those in need. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Will you just stand, please? And please remain standing as we sing our final song on page 93 in The Secret, page 93.
seated. Hey, thanks everyone for being here today and love to entertain your thoughts, comments, etc. So, Doug, yeah. about all the various contradictions that you find in scripture about um, don't, I don't condemn you but go and sin no more or the, my burden is easy and my, or my yoke is easy and my burden is light but uh, straight is the way and narrow is the path this kind of thing or, yeah. Yeah. or about um, Doing your good in secret, not letting the left hand know what the right hand does, and yet letting your light shine. And um, and I'm reminded also in the Old Testament about the, uh, you know, the the loving and forgiving God who is slow to anger and all, and, and merciful, and yet you know the angry God who is who is uh, going to smite you. And and they, they, there's this alternation, and and it it reminds me of. Um, what I read in, in um, William James a while back about the difference between light and fluffy religions and dark and and uh, and nasty religions or or in, and demanding religions and I think there's I think in all of us at different times there's a need to be upbraided and told we need to get our acts together and then there's also the need to be told you can't dwell on it and beat yourself up and so I'm just I'm just Mm. struck by that contrast and trying to get the right balance between those things. Yeah. Well, I think if we think of it as a, uh, a kind of a, a view into our own life, I mean, how many of us are erratic like that? Um, <laughs> I think that's, and Peter in the New Testament is a symbol of our faith too, and you can see where he gets things right and where he gets things terribly wrong and where he's says, Lord, I'll never leave you, and then he denies them, and, you know, all these sorts of things, because that's what our faith is like, and so it's in process. It's it's growing, it's faltering, it's learning, it's, and uh, so those contradictions really illustrate us and illustrate our journey. It's not it's not who the Lord is, but it's more of who we are, um, but we do need to be, like you said, I think we need to be reminded of both those messages that yeah, you are loved and forgiven, and you need to work on it, or else you're not going to work on it, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to work on it if I don't have to, but if I realize that I have to because it's hurting and frustrating and killing my life, then I'll probably wake up and pay attention. So at some point you get beyond that where you don't need those sorts of um, kicks in the rear end, but I think a lot of us do. <laughs> I don't know if Chuck still needs them, but the rest of us <laughs> do. Thanks for your thoughts, Doug. I don't know if you uh, have more to say. You want to pass it along? Or anybody else? Uh, here, thank you. And Chuck, you want to go? Okay, here. I think I only heard about a quarter of the sermon because it's such a powerful topic and I just kept, my brain kept spinning out on thinking about how this shows up in my life, be it with students or coworkers or loved ones, or of course myself. And uh, so thank you, and just do it again in the next four or five weeks so I can hear the whole thing, please. <laughs> um, we'll just put it online. You can watch it over and over again. <laughs> I don't have the self-discipline for that. <laughs> um, the, the guilt and shame piece was super helpful, and I never quite heard it framed like that. I'm really grateful for that. Welcome. Thank you, Kier. Yeah, it's, it's sad. I mean, you probably experienced this emotion, I imagine, working with students and seeing how you just want them to be okay, feel okay about themselves and know that they're wonderful beings and yeah, you're going to struggle, but you're awesome, right? Just, if I can get you to at least believe that much. Um, but it's, it's hard, it's heartbreaking to, to see how much people struggle. If, if we could just do a better job to collectively of loving other people and helping them t to be lifted up, because the hells are doing plenty <laughs> to beat the snot out of everybody. So we don't need to, to add to that by any means. So Thanks, care for that. Uh, I have Chuck and Margaret next. Uh, I guess this is on, yes. Um, 
Doug and Kara had deep things to say. I have something superficial, but it's a footnote to your opening story. I remember reading about a psychology experiment in which um, graduate students were told that certain groups of cats were specially bred for brain power and certain others weren't, and they were picked at random. And then when the graduate students were training them to run mazes and do whatever it is they do, uh, the group had been told that they were special, really came out better. And that's totally nonverbal. Right, right. So even for cats. Thank you. Yeah. That, tri that was Trish's wheelhouse right there, talking about cats. Margaret, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, I was thinking what popped up for me um, when I was listening to Doug was um, that somewhere along the line I've heard that the Bible represents, the entire Bible represents the grand man, hmm. the person, one person, okay. and that person's development through, through um, you know, spiritual growth. And uh, so I think, like you said, we are full of contradictions and we're f uh, conceptions that, you know, may or may not be right or that we can grow out of. And... Uh, ultimately come to that uh, peace and the place where I suppose it does feel easy hmm. when you're resting in love. Yeah. Well, that's the seventh day of creation when the Lord rested. That's when the work is done and you don't struggle anymore. You don't have those combats within. And uh, I don't know what that's like, but I'm sure it's nice. Um, <laughs> sure it's something to work for, but thank you, Margaret. Anybody else have any? Peter? Thank you. Apropos of what Doug said, I like to tell children that if somebody is really behaving himself and sees a policeman, the policeman's his friend. If he's behaving very badly and he sees a policeman, the policeman's his enemy. And that's the way we sometimes think about the Lord. Mm. Thank you. Good example. All right. Yeah, those, you still get that rush when the red lights are behind you, even though you're not speeding. But at least I do. <laughs> Anybody else? Is that it? Okay. Well, um, thanks for being here today. And uh, we have two more sermons on this subject. And uh, you have small groups that you are perhaps part of. Or, and uh, we we're looking for extra books. If you know of an extra book for the forgiveness campaign lying around, let me know. Um, so if someone could use that, that person being Forrest, if you see. So... Give me your book if you don't if you don't care <laughs> about spiritual growth. Um, I want to say uh, the Bible studies and John's leading that sounds really fun on Wednesday night. So John chapter three this week and Thursday the band is going to do a, a if you're part of the band a rehearsal and sound check. So come be part of that if you want and community meeting next Sunday the 29th. That's what I wanted to highlight is that. We have an opportunity possibly to partner with somebody with our acre lot that's south of us, um, the one with the labyrinth on it. We'll talk about that then. And also, we're supposed to take counsel that you might have about the selection of the next executive bishop of the general church. And I thought, well, if we have time, let's do that as well, because um, that's something I would like to do to be responsible and get your input. So October 29th, and a um, couple possibilities about community service at the bottom. So... Read those and he's retiring. Yes, It'll, the new bishop's being selected this June, and a year after that, the executive bishop will retire. As far as I understand, it. is that right? That's what I understand. So, the term executive bishop. Why don't you ask the former executive bishop? <laughs> There's probably a time where there was only one bishop, so they didn't have to use that term, I imagine. So, I, I, at least in our small church history. So, <laughs> all right. Any other thing else? Okay. Good to see you all. Hope you have a splendid week of self-forgiveness and um, talk about how wonderful that is next Sunday to be 
living in that space. All right. See ya. <laughs>